Few animals have an evolutionary history as well documented as the horse. These creatures, belonging to the family Equidae, evolved over 55 million years ago and have survived to the modern day, where they've since become facets of numerous environments and stable domestic animals. And while a video on horse evolution is definitely in order for the channel at some point, it's not an easy task, as it presents a daunting web of various lineages and forms. Rather, today I'd like to hone in on just one of those branches of the storied family tree. These would be the zebras. These black and white horses have become to many quintessential hoofstock of the African plains. And for a lot of people, zebras are simply that, black and white African horses. That's all fine and good, but if we're going to tackle the evolution of the zebra, we've got to see what sets it apart from other horses, and moreover, when it's split off from them. First and foremost, zebras belong to the genus Equus, and shares that distinction with horses and donkeys. Of course, the latter name is typically used to describe the domesticated form of an African species, but unfortunately, I refuse to play any games with YouTube, and I have no idea of saying the name of the African wild <coughs> will trigger demonetization. Equus itself first evolved around 4.5 million years ago during the Pliocene, having evolved from Dinohippus. Some molecular estimates peg that date as being earlier, over 5.5 million years ago. And considering the wide range of time in which Dinohippus was alive, that would make a lot of sense. One of, if not the earliest fossil species we have of the genus comes in the form of Equus simplicitans, which is also known as the Hagerman's horse. This animal's also been referred to as the American zebra, with a lot of illustrations depicting it with black and white stripes. That said, we don't actually know what its fur color looked like, and moreover, Simplicidens wasn't really a true zebra, but rather a speculated ancestor of all extant horses in general. To get a bit closer to our zebra friends, we have to look at a later species, Equus denonis. This early Pleistocene horse, evolving 2.5 million years ago, was not found in its evolutionary homeland in North America. Its ancestors traveled via the Bering Land Bridge to the Old World, there, it could be found all throughout Eurasia, from the Iberian Peninsula on the western end, to countries such as Greece and Georgia on the eastern end. This animal is part of a group of horses known as the Stenonines. These animals have been argued to be ancestral to the zebra-donkey branch of the horse family tree, distinguishing themselves from horse horses. Uh, now, I know the term I used sounded super weird, but you know what I mean, I'm talking about Equus ferris. And while Stenonis evolved 2.5 million years ago, scientists have actually pitched the prior divergence of the zebra donkey clade to go back as far as 4 million years ago, shortly after the evolution of Equus simplicitans. But at this point, we can start examining the very first zebras. And despite what some reconstructions might show, zebras are of course more closely related to one another than to any other horses, such as donkeys. But comparing zebras and donkeys, and to other horses in general when it comes to the fossil record, can get a bit tricky given that all of these equines resemble each other so closely, and it becomes even harder when so many of these species only have partially preserved elements such as their skull, meaning that we can't really compare traits such as, for example, longer front legs compared to back legs. In fact, many of the characteristics that distinguish these horses from one another can come down to pretty minor differences in skull structure. And these can get, I'll be honest, very annoying to try and examine, since just looking at the skulls of a horse, ass, it's, ooh, sorry, bad word, donkey and zebra, you can tell that they're nearly identical. And this is true to such a degree that you probably didn't even notice that I've intentionally swapped out these skulls. Suffice it to say, there are times where I don't envy paleontologists, and this has to be one of those times. One characteristic that sets zebras apart is the concavity in their dorsal profile. This is basically referring to a depression that can be seen in their skull from around the top of their head to their nasal region. Now compare this to horses, which have a relatively straight dorsal profile. It should be noted, however, that donkeys also possess concave profiles, and these can occasionally be even more concave than that of some zebras. So then what the heck do we do in this instance? Well, there's a lot of other identifying traits of the skull, which I'll just display here. You see how in-depth these factors can be? But with that, let's take a look at one of the oldest and most well-studied fossil zebras, Equus cubiferensis, evolving 1.9 million years ago in Kenya. You still look like an ass to me. As you can see, this animal has a concave dorsal length, even more so than the earlier Stenonis. And given that it's speculated to be one of the first zebras, there's another aspect of it we can't go without discussing, and that's its potential stripes. Now I say potential since we obviously can't tell when and if the sort of fur pattern actually occurred on the animal, but I figured now would be a good time to talk about why zebras look like that. The subject of the zebra striping have been a common question not only in scientific circles, but even among regular folks. Growing up, I had heard that it would help camouflage itself from predators such as lions. 
However, that's not actually true, and lions have been shown to be able to identify and go after even relatively obscure zebras. Another theory that's been posited has to do with the fact that the stripes could work as a thermoregulatory device. It'd make sense then why zebras have stripes, whereas equines like horses and donkeys found farther north where it could get colder don't have any striping, such as with the Shavalsky's wild horse in Tibetan Kiang. This, however, doesn't seem to be the case. For one, African wild donkeys don't actually have a lot of stripes themselves despite living in very hot regions. Furthermore, there are experiments as well as even infrared photography that don't show any real cooling difference when it comes to the striped animals. Instead, the new prevailing theory is that stripes help deter pests such as flies. Apparently, this pattern isn't as effective over longer distances, but up close, insects can get confused by the lines of black and white, failing to decelerate during flight and either flying over or bumping into the animals instead. Oh yeah, and to answer this real quick, zebras are black with white stripes. I always thought it was the other way around, but no, these horses have black skin, which is why you can sometimes see these sick-looking, nearly pure black zebras. And I'm not gonna lie, editing this video right now and looking at these zebras, I really want to eat some Oreos. But I'm on a cut right now, so let's just move on to some more extinct species. And in particular, I'd like to highlight three. The first of these is Equus maritanicus, an animal that's been reported to have evolved as far back as one million years ago. This zebra is unique for the locality in which it lived in, and it's that location that gives it its common name, the Saharan Zebra. That area of Africa today is covered in scorching desert, but the Pleistocene saw many periods in which this hostile region was instead covered with lush greenery, and this boon and foliage created an ideal habitat for Maritanicus. It's easy to understand, then, why the species went extinct, as it probably disappeared in tandem with the aridification of the region, and is dated to have died out around 6,000 years ago, according to some more recent estimates. The next species is the giant cape zebra, Equus capensis. As the name suggests, what makes this South African zebra unique was that it was one of the largest zebras of all time, clocking it at estimates of 450 kilograms or almost 1,000 pounds. That isn't actually too much bigger than high-end numbers we're going to see later on for some extant species, but given that we do have limited remains, chances are high that it could have gone even heavier than this. And another thing to note is that despite me having just called this a distinct species, Recent studies have indicated that this might have actually been a simple subspecies of the living plain zebra, so it would be listed as Equus quaha capensis. Now, there's not too much evidence for why this zebra went extinct, though it has been speculated to have died out alongside many other Pleistocene megafauna sometime around 10,000 years ago, although some estimates do have it dying a bit later than that. The final extinct species I want to cover is Equus oldowiensis, which was present during the Pleistocene around 2.33 million years ago. If you look at that date, you realize that this could have very well been the oldest true zebra, being even older than Kubaferensis. But again, additional research would need to have to be made to fully set this in stone. This zebra has been uncovered in countries such as Kenya and Tanzania, and was a bit larger than modern zebras. As for what makes this animal unique, I'm just going to take a wild guess and say the dentition of the skull having a large and broad incisor arcade with the incisor teeth having infundibula on I1 and I2, and which may be absent on lower third incisor? Wait, there's no way I actually guessed that. As you can see, there isn't an awful lot that distinguishes this zebra from its close relatives without getting into the absolute nitty gritty. One of the only reasons I'm even covering it right now is because it was present in prehistoric planet. But even then, the animal looked so similar to modern zebras that I straight up thought it was a regular zebra. For example, a CGI zebra is used in a scene in Africa given its proximity to some prehistoric animals, and as a result everything looks great. It's moments like these why I consider myself one of the stupidest paleo YouTubers, and why I'm better off not quitting my day job. There's something else notable about the animal though, and that's that it was speculated to have evolved into the modern Grevy zebra. And I feel like with that it's time to discuss the living species of zebra. There are three species of zebra alive today. These include the aforementioned Grevy zebra, Equus Grevy, the plain zebra, Equus Quaha, and the mountain zebra, Equus Zebra. This is not a deep dive video onto the living species, so I'd just like to go over the basic differences between them. First off, the Grevy zebra. This is found in East Africa and is the largest of all zebra species, reaching weights of around 450 kilograms or 990-ish pounds. Beyond that, it's notable for its long face and how thin and close its stripes are to one another. Next is the plain zebra, found in both East and Southern Africa. You'll see that its stripes are far broader and more spaced out. Finally is the mountain zebra, the southernmost inhabiting zebra. This zebra also has pretty broad stripes, and they can be spaced quite far apart, especially at the rear end of this animal. The zebra also is distinguished by the presence of a dewlap, or a little skin fold thingy, on its neck. There's a couple reasons as to why this could have evolved, anything from regulating body temperature or just being a tool for sexual selection. 
Of course, you can't talk about zebras in any sort of evolutionary context without discussing the very recently extinct quaha. This animal lived in the far south of the continent, in the Karoo region of South Africa. Long thought to have been a separate species, it's now seen to be a subspecies of the plain zebra, listed as Equus quaha quaha. This is perhaps the easiest of the recent zebras for practically anyone to tell apart, given that it ditches the solely black and white of its relatives, opting for a greater mix of brown on its coats, and possesses fewer stripes in general. This could be due to the fact that the environments in which they lived in were known to have had fewer biting flies compared to where the mountain, grevies, and rest of the plain zebras lived. Unfortunately, the quaha, alongside animals such as the dodo and the stellar sea cow, is an emblem of modern age extinctions. Following the European settlement of South Africa, these zebras began to be killed at an alarming rate, primarily due to the fact that the quaha would prove competition for their own livestock for grazing areas. Sadly, the animal went extinct in the wild by 1878, with the last captive individual dying in 1883. There are projects today in order to quote-unquote bring back the quaha, though this is less about reviving the extinct zebra subspecies, and more so just about bringing that unique coat pattern on extant zebras. Of all the evolution videos I've done on this channel, this had to be one of the most difficult. This is due in part to how similar so many of these species were to one another. And I wouldn't blame you for asking what the point of all of this even was. But I think there's a big necessity in covering information such as this. For one, it's important to be able to map out the history of animals such as equines as thoroughly as possible. But in a modern context, differentiating between different, near-identical species is crucial when it comes to identifying threatened populations and taking the steps to preserve them. For example, zebra species today fall under a variety of threatened statuses, with plain zebras being near-threatened to grevy zebras being outright endangered. Some good news is that the rampant hunting of these animals has reduced in recent years, and with the right steps in place, populations across animals will begin to recover and will see these animals on the continent for the foreseeable future. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, make sure to give it a like, make sure to subscribe, and make sure to hype it if you can. We're almost at 100,000 subscribers, so let's keep it up and hopefully we reach that goal. I'll see you guys next time.